We've heard from several people who are talking about nuclear power, including a Democratic governor of Maryland, uh, Governor O'Malley, and take a look at what he's got to say. I'm very much in favor of nuclear energy, and I believe that the sort of technology that is now being employed you know, in Europe and by uh, the French in particular is something that needs to come to the United States, Sort certainly over the short term. I believe it holds a tremendous amount of, of promise, and I think that we need to catch up. I think we're way behind the ball on nuclear energy, and I hope that we'll have a third reactor that's modern and that is safe and is state-of-the-art in a foreseeable future in Maryland. It's the nuclear power plants that can that can generate electricity at scale with no emissions. Boy, and you it's want to talk about scale, expensive. And it's the large scale um, renewable uh, farms that can do it at scale. But by the way, those are expensive too. Ahead, energy is a problem because it's hard to most people can't see scale on energy. Right. So let, let me give you scale. Let's assume that by 2050, the entire planet is at the average consumption level of Papua New Guinea. We're really efficient. We need 28,000 power plants at the size of a gigawatt of plant. Right. How many? 28,000. Today we have 13,000 around the world. 3,000 will disappear by then. You won't be able to fix them. We need 18,000 new plants in 40 years. That means if we went nuclear, we need a new nuclear plant every 18 hours. How many nuclear plants can you build and where do you put them? Now, we talked about not wanting to have a windmill in your backyard. How about a nuclear in your in well, the neighborhood? It, you know, it's funny you you mention that because in our energy learning curve, uh, we t the public weighs in and and guess what? How willing are you to accept construction of a nuclear power plant in your area? Forty-seven percent say, vary or somewhat, I'm fine with it. Forty-seven percent say, no. Right down the middle. Yeah, but one more accident just, and you, nuclear is dead. Could you define to them what is your area? I mean, uh, excuse me, when you're talking about nuclear, a nuclear power plant, I think they get big, it. You know? big, yeah, yeah, yeah. But hold on, hold on. You know, we've, we've got 104 nuclear power plants in America. The communities that have them are very accepting of them. They are cited, most of them are cited relatively remotely. But they provide the foundation for the transmission. They can provide a foundation for actually making the economic justification for the transmission systems that make wind and solar possible. So we can find a way to, to marry these. And so, by the way, we need to do it because we need everything. Shy is right. You can't do it all with nuclear. You can't do it all with renewables. Even in transportation, you can't do it all with electricity. Right. We need wind more than the entire planet has wind. We need more water uh, dams than the entire water in the world. If we went to biofuel, we need more than the arable land for the entire me, planet. There's one thing that scales. Mm -hmm. Sun. It's a perfect place to make a little transition here. We even heard from Girl Scouts at Planet, and you don't want to cross the Girl Scouts. They come, they, come from, they come from Rochester, New York. Converting to solar energy is very cost efficient because the only fuel needed is the sun. If we were all to switch over to solar energy, this would reduce the stress on our wallets and the environment. Whether you use solar ovens for camping or convert your house completely to generated electricity by the sun, any little bit can help. Together, we can move this planet forward. Solar power. They say it's energy cost efficient. Is it? The machinery to make silicon go half price every 18 months, supplied material, have basically gone back and said, oh, we know how to do that half every 18 months. And they're doing exactly the same thing to solar panels. It's part of what I saw out at the National Renewable Energy Lab. I want you to meet <laughs> Steve Robbins, who has a special interest in solar power. So this is where all the power comes down. The main line Meet Steve Robbins, solar panel owner. He also researches photovoltaic technology at the National Renewable Energy Lab outside Denver. We can actually see here how much is coming in. 630 watts is being produced right now. But you're producing more electricity than you're using in your house here? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what I was going to mention. We, uh, we even get a check back from the utilities company each year. Well, they pay you? They pay me, yeah, <laughs> for any excess. That's so, not bad. So this year, the grand total was, they actually sent me a letter saying what it would be, but uh, this is, I thought I'd wait for you guys to open the check. So $98.24. So instead of paying a bill, we're actually getting money back. Robbins paid 17 grand for his system after tax rebates and incentives. The actual cost of his system, though, more than twice that. Cost forty thousand dollars to put the system in, so that you can save about hundred and forty dollars a month. That's not great economics. That's not great economics yet. <laughs> Robbins takes that problem to work with him. We're building this to create a better way to study photovoltaics. 
In the lab, Robbins is working on developing new generation photovoltaic systems. We actually put the products in here. This is like deep space vacuum. The more affordable thin film systems will allow more of us to put the sun to work generating clean energy. What you're working on here and what you're holding here is a different system than the traditional photovoltaics Absolutely. that have powered the solar panels in the past, right? Absolutely. So we're talking 100 to 200 uh, times less material, and that makes this much more affordable to make. This then is the future, you think? This is definitely the future. How would that affect the bottom line for the cost of putting your sure. house online like sure. that? Sure. Well, actually, remember my system before rebates was like $40,000. You're probably talking about, you know, eight or $9,000 for a system. Really? That and much that's, of a, that much that's of a before, That's before incentives or whatnot. But yeah, it, it would definitely, because right now the, the bulk of the cost of a photovoltaic system, like on my house, is the solar panels. Is he right that it can come down to five, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000? So the, the material part of it is is going to cut by 50% every 18 to 24 months. The problem is the installation cost. So we're already at a point where the installation cost is going to be above the cost of material. And at that point, it will become more of the integrator's world. Can I get panels that are bigger? Can I get installation that is simpler? Can I get it to become pre-installed roof and instead of something I add on top? I've, I've seen them where they're actually part of the shingle itself, Absolutely. where it's actually built into the shingle. When you get there, then the cost of installation becomes zero because it's part of building the roof, at which point... You, you really pay just for the material, and every roof becomes a generator. Integration in the end is the Absolutely. way we're going to deal with this, but that requires a lot of investment over time, and we should go there. But in the meantime, for every big wind farm, it's backed up by a fossil baseload plan. We the should. Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians are going into renewables in a very big way. And They're if we want to deal with climate change, this is what we will do. Okay, a little pushback. Uh, this is Kenneth Green. Now, he says, he holds up a cup and he says, I can have, you, you're going to have more energy in this cup from coal or from gas, crude, than you're going to have with diffused power, which is wind or solar. But there's also another problem, he says, and he calls it... Green hypocrisy. If you look around the country, places like Cape Cod being the most best-known example, but Nevada, Wisconsin, Maine, California, Pennsylvania, West Virginia... Environmental groups at the local level are blocking alternative energy projects that are on the ground that are trying to be built. So, for example, if you wanted to run power from the inland valleys of California out to San Diego, you have to cross a state park, and the environmentalists will block the power lines. This is the case with almost all of these projects, wind and solar power, which suggests you're not going to see them anytime soon. The national groups say, we're all for it. The state groups say, we don't want it. And so what's likely to happen is you'll have this energy not materialize while your coal and, and natural gas plants age and wear out to the point that you'll wind up with a crunch. And then people will build more of the traditional fossil fuel plants to replace the energy. I saw you nodding your head yes through that entire, through his entire piece. But the dilemma is um, my job in the White House was to oversee the environmental review process. In the Bush White in House. In the Bush White House. And, and there's someone who does that in the Obama administration too. And the environmental review process is what's used by local opposition groups, and it's not just green groups, it's, you know, rich, you know, beachfront property owners. I mean, it's my experience you need six months to do an environmental review and then do six months to have conflict resolution. And how long does it take? Um, it can take five to 15 years. Five to 15 years. The big project off of Cape Cod has been stuck for nine years now. Hunter Levins, is it true that environmental groups get in the way of clean, renewable energy? The environmentalists are calling for dropping the need, so we don't need to put facilities in sensitive areas. There ought to be some parts of the Earth that we leave the way they have been. We ought not to pave the entire damn planet. Well, are, are, we, are we in total agreement or disagreement here? Still a lot of innovation left, but I'll tell you, I want to see Shai's cars, they're going to be nuclear-powered, and they're going to be wind-powered, and they're going to be solar-powered, if we want zero emissions out of this, well, if we want energy security out of this.